Boa tarde. Good afternoon to you all in English. It's a great pleasure for me to be here uh, and I'm going, we are going to, to talk about uh, regional fisheries management organizations. Uh, they are established by agreements, so the real name should be regional fisheries management organizations. Uh, I have been uh, involved uh, with RFMO's negotiations since 1998. Uh, I'm a professor at the uh, Federal Rural University of Pernambuco, uh, but because my university is a federal university, I'm a federal, I'm, a, I'm an employee of the federal government, uh, and the ministries and secretariats of fisheries that we have had in Brazil along the past 20 years have used my capacity uh, as a negotiator in many uh, international fora related mainly to fisheries, a bit uh, aquaculture as well, but mainly, mainly fisheries, uh, including the ICAT, the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, that I have chaired uh, for two mandates, and also the FAO Committee on Fisheries that I have also chaired. So uh, what I wanted uh, to do today is to share with you uh, all my knowledge related to how these organizations work and, in other words, how the international game is played. So, uh, in order to talk about, uh, I think I should get down here. I think from here is better. Yeah, I have more space. So, in order to talk about regional fisheries management organizations, uh, we need to first talk a little bit about fisheries. And here we have the world production uh, of uh, seafood, uh, the world fisheries production from capture fishers and aquaculture. We see the aquaculture is in blue and the capture fisher is in ochre or in yellow. And we can see that uh, the capture fishers increased constantly after the Second World War as many of the international fishing fleets became uh, uh, more industrialized. Uh, we just saw an example presented by Anthony on how the cod fishery in Canada developed, not in a quite pos positive way, but uh, it, it, the, the, the rapid development was part uh, also because of the industrialization that followed the Second World War. But what we see here as well is that uh, in the early 90s, what happened then was that the captured fishers reached a plateau and stopped growing from that point on. Differently from aquaculture that just took over and uh, continued to grow, allowing the world fishers production to have a steady growth uh, throughout this time since 1950. So if we look at this uh, production, uh, Sorry, uh, the total fisheries production, the total world uh, fisheries and aquaculture production today is therefore close to 171 million tons. That's what the world is producing from uh, fisheries and aquaculture. We can see that the total capture accounts for about 91 million tons and the total aquaculture accounts for about 8 million tons. Nevertheless, if we consider that the non-food use is about 20 million and that only capture fish is used as non-food users, we can conclude that today more than half of all the seafood that is, is consumed by mankind already comes from aquaculture. Uh, many of you might not have realized that, but m uh, most of the, the, the fish we consume, most of the seafood we consume, uh, now is already coming from aquaculture and it will be even more from now on because the total production from capture can't grow beyond the present level. If we look at the graph we saw in, in numbers, we can see that uh, the world fisheries production by capture was around 17 million tons in 1950 and it took just one decade to double to 35 million tons in 1960. Uh, nevertheless, in the following two decades, it took two decades uh, to grow from 35 to 70 million tons from 60 to 80 to double. Again, it took double the time. And uh, in the two decades that followed, the increase was only one third of that 
uh, growing from 70 million tons to 95 million tons, only 35%, up to 2000. In 2016, that's the last year uh, when we, we do have statistics uh, available from FAO, uh, the production was 90 million lower than the one in 2000. In, in the last five years, we can see that it fluctuated between 89.5 to 92.7. Uh, so according to FAO, the maximum amount of fish we would be able to get from the oceans would be around 105 million tons, meaning that we are already very close to the ceiling. If we look uh, in, 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 in why we are, we are close to the ceiling. Uh, does anyone have a hypothesis to that? Why we are already producing the maximum amount that the oceans can produce from capture? Any hypothesis? Why we get to the ceiling? Well, because the capacity of the fish stocks to produce has been exhausted. We, have, we are basically taking from the oceans the much that oceans can produce. And if we take a look on, on the status of the different stocks, we can see that 7% of the world stocks are underexploited, meaning that the biomass, the total number of fish that is in the sea, is above what we call maximum sustainable yield. Uh, maximum sustainable yield is the amount you can take from a given fish stock every year, knowing that we will be able to take the same amount throughout, I mean, forever. Uh, is the maximum amount that it can be taken from a given fish stock. So only 7% of the world fish stocks are underexploited, meaning that they can produce more than they are producing right now. They are being, their biomass is above the level that would sustain uh, uh, the maximum sustainable yield, that would allow the, the maximum sustainable yield. The vast majority of the fish stock, 60 fish stocks, 60%, they are fully exploited, meaning that they are being taken uh, at the level uh, which corresponds to the maximum sustainable yield. So their production can't be increased. And we have another 33% of stocks that are overexploited, meaning that their biomass is below the one needed to give the maximum sustainable yield. So we, are, we took already too much fish from those stocks. They need to recover from the present situation. So we basically have only 7% of the world stocks that can produce more than they are producing right now. Uh, but let's understand a little bit better what uh, maximum sustainable yield is. We here have a figure that shows how uh, the population size changes according to the fisheries exploitation. So K would be this point would be a population that has never been fished, would be the virgin biomass, as you can see here. So this curve shows the amount of fish we can take every year to keep the population in that same position. For example, uh, to keep the population at that level, the amount of fish I can get is around here. So if every year I take that amount of fish, the population will keep here. So if it's the, is a similar situation, in this case, the, the population would be underexploited, but is similar to the situation where the population is overexploited. You see that the size of the population in A is much less than in B, and here is the amount I can take every year to keep the population at that level. So what we can see here is that about here, when the biomass is close, uh, to half of the virgin population is when I can get most of the fish from that population. That's what we call maximum sustainable yield. That curve is different from different stocks. If a stock is, is more productive, then the MSY is not uh, achieved when the population is at half of its original size, but when it's it a bit larger than that. For example, shark populations, uh, their MSY would be much closer to the virgin population than sardines, for example, where the MSY would be reached in a much lower level. But if we 
get an, an average of all fish stocks in the world, so we would get uh, somewhere around here, meaning that when uh, a population uh, of a given fish species is reduced to half of its virgin size, of its unfished size, it's when we will have the maximum sustainable yield. Uh, and it might come uh, as a surprise to many of you that are not uh, used to fishery science. For example, if I tell you that, uh, uh, if I would tell you that half of the fish populations in the world are now, are presently at half of what they used it to be in the past when they were not fished. So what would be your reaction to that? You probably would say, many of you probably would say, well, that's very bad news. Well, you are telling me that the biomass of fish has been reduced to half, so it means they are in trouble. Not at all, which is not the case. Uh, we see from here that uh, when the biomasses are reduced by about, on average, half of the original size of the virgin size of the unfished size is generally when we get the maximum sustainable yield. And it's important to understand that because there are a lot of myths going on and we will try to, to, to Dismiss, demystify some of these myths uh, throughout uh, our lecture today. So everybody's okay with MSY? What's the meaning of MSY? You have a question? Yeah, Hi. sure. Uh, it's like, uh, so we're almost, like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Take from the oceans. Yes. Well, the actual number might not be real, but the trend is much more likely to be real than the actual number, meaning that uh, the countries that are not reporting the entire production, they have consistently not reported throughout time, so the trend wouldn't change much. Although the total uh, uh, amount of fish caught might not be 170 million, might be 200 or 202 million, but that would not change the fact that the we have reached the ceiling. So the trend is very clear. I mean, we, we were growing and then we are, we are flat. And there is no expectation that we can change that trend. So we, we cannot, we should not have any hope of increasing uh, the amount of, uh, the, uh, of, of fish that we can take from the oceans. Uh, that's a fact. Uh, of course, if we use other means like uh, enriching the oceans with fertilizers and things like that, then we could increase that amount, but that would be more related to an aquaculture kind of activity than just capture fishers as it is. And of course, uh, uh, in terms of aquaculture, the amount of fish we can take from the oceans uh, could be very well 10 times, 20 times more than, even more than that than we have today. And that's the only way humanity, mankind is being able to keep the, f the, the seafood supply uh, because of the growth of aquaculture, otherwise we would all be eating much less fish because the production would be half of what we would be consuming today, meaning that the price would be also much more expensive. I have a question over there. Not, not really, because there aren't many uh, unfished or unexploited resources left. That's a realization. Th there are some, for example, uh, we could increase the amount of krill that is caught in, in, in the Antarctic, uh, and we are not catching as much as we could there, uh, but uh, all of that would have also ecological consequences that would, it, it would take too much time for us to discuss here, but the fact is that we can't increase much, even considering the unexploited stocks, we can't, we can't go much further than where we are right now. Uh, and to understand that, uh, so yeah, as I said, the maximum sustainable yield is generally reached when the fish population is around half its version size. Uh, and, and to understand that, we have, the reason for that is because the oceans are an immense desert. Desert. Not dessert. <laughs> Desert. <laughs> yes, it would. So, uh, and that's another thing that many people don't realize. Uh, is there anybody here from Australia? 
You are from Australia. Good. I, would, would I be right if I say, well, Australia is a huge country, it's a continent. It has a lot of land. So Australia has a big potential to become uh, the largest producer of food in the world. Would, it, would that be right? Why not? It's a desert, yeah, exactly. So uh, it's the same situation. Australia, most of Australian territory is, is a desert. So you can't grow food there because you have the land, but you don't have, in that case, the water. In the ocean, of course, we do have the water, but uh, we don't have the land, meaning we don't have the nutrients needed to make sure that uh, we have production. 90% uh, of captured fishers' productions, production comes from 2 to 3% of ocean area. And that shows very clear how desert, desert, the, how desert the oceans are, you see? So you, 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 we, we should think about the oceans as immense deserts with some oases located, I mean, isolated oases of high productivity, like areas of coastal upwelling, for example, or uh, equatorial divergence, and a few areas where we have phenomena that enriches these water, but otherwise the oceans are big deserts. And why is that? Why the oceans are so poor? And, and there's a very simple explanation to that. Why? Well, to have, to have photosynthesis, which is the basis uh, uh, of, of the food chain. Uh, when, when I was a kid, maybe some of you have, have done that. I, I took some, some beans and put in the in a cotton with water and uh, watched it grow and put another one in, in a dark place and it didn't grow. I did that. Maybe some of one have done. Uh, so I've learned that uh, for a plant to grow, we need nutrients, water, light, and carbon dioxide, isn't it? Do we have water in the oceans? Of course we do. We do have carbon dioxide, okay? But what about nutrients? And more important than that, what about light? And that's the answer. So the reason why the oceans are so poor is because of a difference of depth. Is because the mean depth of the ocean is 3,800 meters. But the depth of the orthotic zone is up to 200 meters. On average, it could go as much as 250 meters, depending on the species of algae and so on, but uh, only 200 meters. So it means that most of the water column, you don't have light. So, and I have a very bad news to tell you now. I don't know if you know that, but all of you are going to die. Yes, I'm sorry to say that. I'm sorry, it's a fact of life, but if you didn't know, it's gonna happen. And it's also gonna happen to the zooplankton and to the phytoplankton, to the skipjack and to the umberjack and to the tunas and every, everybody's going to die. Everybody's gonna die in the ocean. So when the phytoplankton, the zooplankton, when they die, what happens to them? They go down, they sink. And of course, their or the organic matter in their bodies, as in our bodies, uh, will be decomposed by the, the organisms like the worms in our dead body. I'm sorry if I'm looking a bit gross, but anyway, <laughs> they will use up the organic matter that's in our body. So that organic matter will be used by these, these um, uh, organisms that decompose organic matter and then the nutrients will be dissolved back into the water. But that's going to happen well under 200 meters in most of the case. So these nutrients will get back eventually to the water, but then there will be no light. So any nutrient that get available, that become available in that very thin layer that covers the ocean will be used up by the phytoplankton will be, that will be eaten by the zooplankton, by the sardine, and by the tuna, and so on. But all these will die, and they will sink, and all these nutrients will be taken away from the productive layer of the oceans. So the oceans suffer a continuous depletion of the nutrients available, and that's why 
90% uh, of the world capture fishers come from only 2-3% of the ocean area. These 2-3% are the oases, like in the, in the desert, when you have places where you have water, and then you have palm trees and everything grows around it. In the ocean, the place where we have nutrients being brought up to a layer uh, in which depth the light is also available, then you have an explosion of life, and the, the life develops there. That's why uh, Brazil will never be one of the largest producers of fish by capture. Uh, while Peru and Chile, they have been and they will always be among the 10 largest producers because there is a big coastal upwelling happening in their coast. So we can solve that, we could change that if we hire Superman to change the way the earth spins, then we would have the coastal upwelling, not Peru and Chile, but that's the way uh, earth uh, spins and that's how it is. So, and that's basically the explanation, all that will die and will become organic, sorry, that's in Portuguese, will become organic matter that will sink and will be decomposed, but that will happen at 3,800 meters where you don't have light. And so the photosynthesis happens only in this very thin layer. So the oceans are continuously, de continuously depleted of nutrients. And the tip committee is because Brazil's large coastline, we should be one of the top producers of seafood from capture fishers in the world. We even today listen a lot of people from the government saying this kind of thing. A new minister that comes into power say, well, I, we have no reason for Brazil not to be one of the largest producers in the world because look, we have 8,500 kilometers of coastline. Of course, that's uh, not true at all. Uh, and the truth is that at least uh, with regard to ocean productivity, size does not matter. Productivity does matter. Uh, but there are two ways we, we saw that we are reaching the limit uh, of the capacity of the oceans, that what the oceans can produce uh, in terms uh, of, of uh, seafood. Uh, but we can, we can convey that message in, in a two very different manners. For example, I can say that about 70%, uh, in fact, it, it is 67% of the world fish stocks are underexploited or fully exploited, meaning that they are being sustainably exploited at a level compatible with the maximum sustainable yield. And if I tell you that, well, look, about 70% of the world fish stocks are being sustainably uh, exploited. So you'd have a good impression on that. You said, well, it, it seems good, it seems they are okay. Which is totally different from uh, that way of conveying the same message. If I say about 95%, 93% to be exact, of the world fish stocks are overexploited or fully exploited. Here being 60% of that. Of course, I have two completely different views on how the world fish stocks are, in fact, and most of the time, if not exclusively, we have this kind of, of view. Uh, there is a, an overall view that the world fish stocks is in big trouble and that they are going to collapse in 2048 and things like that. So uh, the way it's generally conveyed by the media, I just took one example, I could have hundreds of, of that. You see here, uh, the top 10 things we learned about the oceans, that was back in 2014, but we can see here is the percentage of high seas that are fished, and here is the percentage of species exploited, overexploited, or collapsed. And we can see that looking by this graph here is 87%, we'd say, wow, the fish disappeared from the oceans because 87% is the only thing we read is overexploited or, or collapsed, but we forget that about 60% is just exploited at MSY. So this is a way to convey a situation, a condition of these stocks that, that's not at all uh, what's really happening. Uh, if we take a look at the evolution of these stocks, we can see that uh, and from 75 to 2015, we can see that underfished stocks, of course, went from 40%, as we saw, to 7%. They declined because fisheries expanded, the population grew, and we are, of course, fishing more. That's, that should happen, would be expected. Then we have the amount of fish that would be overfished was rather stable until the 80s, and then it increased 
quite significantly, but after that, it kind of got stable around, fluctuating around 30%, and we are talking about almost 30 years. So for the past three decades, the percentage of stocks in the world that have been overfished have been around 30%. We are a little more now, 33%. It, it doesn't mean that everything is fine. It means we do have a problem because we have one third of the fish stocks in the world overexploited means a big problem, but it's far from catastrophic than uh, projections like that would, would pretend to, to be real. Uh, if, you, if we draw a graph like that starting from 1950 when the fish stocks were almost not fished and, and of course the, the amount of, of fish with problem would grow and if we just draw a line continuously, you would get to that kind of prophecy that by 2048 uh, the fish stocks in the world would have collapsed, which is not at all what we are seeing from the data available. What we see much more than a, a trend to a catastrophic collapse of all old fish stocks is a much more stable trend for the past 30 years. Of course, again, uh, that doesn't mean that uh, we do not have problems. We have to significantly improve the way we manage fish uh, stocks, the way we manage our fishers, but that doesn't mean that the fish is going to be over in, in a few decades. Uh, and if we try to understand how this has developed, uh, it, we are going to realize that the situation is different uh, in developed countries than it is in developing countries. And let's take a look at that. Let's see how ha that has developed throughout the year, the years, keeping in mind that for almost the past 30 years, the percentage of stocks overfished have been around 30%. We are now at 33%. So let's keep that in mind. So that has been stable. But how has the stocks in developed countries uh, behaved a long time? Uh, let's start with US. Someone from US here? Ah, congratulations, you have been doing a very, very good job to manage your stocks, indeed. You see here, this is a, a Fish Stock Sustainability Index. It's used by NOAA, it's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration of the United States. And what you can see if, since 2000 is a continuous and significant improvement in the condition of US stocks throughout time. You see that, and you see news like that, in 2015, 37 stocks had been rebuilt. So the situation of US stocks now is much better, much, much better than used to be 20, 30 years ago, because the fishers management has improved there. And if we take a look at Australia, that's your country, we can see a similar situation. You see the stocks that are not overfished has improved throughout time, continuously. So the situation is much better than it used to be. If we look at Norway, for example, this is the size of the stock in biomass of pelagic species, the, the, the fish species that live in the, in the water column, and the ground fish species that live close to the bottom. And you can see that their size has continuously grew since 85. So Norwegian stocks now are doing very well, and they have improved quite significantly uh, a long time. To, just get one example of a shared stock between Norway and, and Russia, uh, differently from what happened with, with the Canadian stock of cod. Uh, this is how the stock of cod from the Barents Seas has behaved, and you can see that it went into a, a low around the 80s, but since then it started to grow, and recently they have gone beyond 2 million tons. This is almost double the largest size of spawn stock biomass that was recorded uh, in the beginning of this series before 1950, meaning this stock now is extremely healthy. And, and we find examples like that all over the developed world. We see that uh, the fish stocks in New Zealand are improving, in, in most European countries are improving as well. So, developed states in general are doing a, a very good job in ensuring the sustainability of their fishers and the conservation of their fish stocks. That's what's happening. Uh, with exceptions like the Canadian cod we saw, we saw that example. There are, of course, examples of, of fishers that have collapsed, uh, that have had uh, management problems, but in general, the, the situation of the fish stocks in developed countries have 
improved. So if the amount of overfished stocks have been stable for the past 30 years, what well, that means? It means that another part of the world must have gone much worse. And that's developing countries. That's us, Brazil, Brazil included there. So uh, taking our example, how is the present situation of fish stocks in Brazil? We do not have a clue. We don't know. We have no idea what's going on. And the reason for that, and believe it or not, uh, we don't have, someone has said that in the, in the morning today in one of the questions. We haven't had a uh, fisheries statistics system in place for over 10 years now. So if you ask me how much fish we are catching uh, off red snapper, I have no idea. Uh, a few species we do have some idea uh, because specific reasons. For example, uh, in the case of tunas, we had to have, because if we don't provide accurate statistics to ICAT, which is the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, then we wouldn't be allowed to catch tunas. Uh, and there are some sp special cases where we do have a better idea of how much fish is being caught, but there is no official fisheries, national fisheries statistics. Uh, and and th that, of course, is a, is a disaster. Uh, because without uh, knowing how much fish you were taking uh, and consequently having no idea on what fishing effort is producing that amount that you don't know about means that you can have no planning, you have no idea where fisheries can be developed, where fishers, what kind of fishers should be reduced, uh, and, and so on. And, and this is not a particular, a peculiar situation of Brazil. That's a situation faced by many developing countries. Nevertheless, I have to say, and that's a very pitiful thing to say, but uh, I would dare to say that Brazil today is one of the countries in the entire world uh, which is in the most disgraceful situation with regard to fisheries management. Uh, because our fisheries management has been destroyed pretty much in the past 10 years. We hope that's going to improve. We hope that uh, it's going to get better, but that's the present situation right now. Someone has a, had a question and raised a hand. Uh, uh, who was it? I answered your question. Okay, so it's pitiful, but uh, it's, it's reality. And, and, and the main cause for that uh, and, and for some people that comes as a surprise, for example, I have been, as I said, participating in NICAT meetings for too long, I would say. Uh, and people were very much surprised to see that during a time Brazil went uh, getting better and better information, better data, providing scientific information. We, at the time, uh, like 10 years ago, uh, we were the third country with the highest number of scientific uh, papers produced in the meetings that I had that year, so we were doing very well. And then everything kind of started to break down uh, unt until we had the ap apex of our crisis last year. I'm going to talk a bit about that and what happened. But uh, And then people would ask me, but why? What's happening uh, with Brazil? And I would say, well, you, you see, uh, it's very clear to me now that what, what really characterizes a developing state is not uh, the, the internal gross product. It's not the, the, the human development index. It's the instability of its institutions. That's the main thing. And that's the reason why we are in the situation that we are presently today, so that we know uh, about 20 years ago, there was uh, uh, an organ uh, 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 that would be responsible for the fishery sector in Brazil that was called SUDEP, Superintendência para o Desenvolvimento da Pesca. It would be uh, uh, secretary for the fisheries development. But then uh, that was extinct, and the competence of SUDEP was transferred to Brazilian Environmental Agency. Then after that, it was shared between the Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture of the Ministry of Agriculture and of the Environmental Agency. So since then, Brazil uh, has a kind of a schizophrenic uh, management uh, policy. 
it is schizophrenic because the management is divided between two ministries. It's half in the Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture, or Secretary, or whatever name it got, as you are going to see, and the other half is in the Ministry of the Environment. And uh, everything that, uh, every management measure that needs to be taken needs the agreement of between these two ministries, and they, the ministers need to sign together. So you can imagine how steadfast that goes, how quick decisions are made, and how efficient things are run, of course not, uh, and, and that's a, a, a kind of a, a fisheries management strategy that is, in my view, a recipe uh, to disaster, as we have been seeing happening in Brazil. But the, this dichotomy, this separation between the, 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 the fisheries, it was a kind of a Solomonic decision, but in a bad way, they really divided the baby in two, uh, and so it, it continues un until today. Uh, we still have that division today, but after that, then uh, a Secretary of Fisheries and Aquaculture was created, linked to the Presidents of the Republic, uh, and after that, uh, a ministry, a Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture. Uh, then the ministry was dismantled in 2015, and the fisheries was sent back to the Ministry of Agriculture, and then it was transferred to the Ministry of Development, in Industry, and Commerce, and then it went back to a secretary in the Presidency of Republic. So all that happened in, in pretty much little more than 10 years, 20 years. Uh, in 20 years, so you see, and the consequences is what uh, we have now, where we are going, only God knows, <laughs> but we should be hopeful, of course. So the institutional management of the fisheries sector in Brazil has been plagued by political instability, and that has had catastrophic uh, results. It has destroyed our fisheries statistics and consequently our capacity to manage our fisheries. So, what about the fish stocks managed by RFMOs? After all, I was supposed to talk about regional fisheries management organizations, and I haven't so far. Uh, and, but to understand how RFMOs work, and I have to take a look at the time here, okay. Uh, somebody will show me when uh, you, you tell me, when you tell me, so that I can play. 15 minutes antes do final dessa primeira aula, okay. Can you, can you tell me half an hour before? So that's okay. So, to understand the regional fisheries management organizations, we have to understand the international legal framework. And I know, I have seen from the program that you already had some uh, lectures on the law of the sea. And uh, so, I'm going to ask a question I think someone has made before. Uh, does anybody here know what unclose means? Yeah, now everybody does. Good. So, Everything started with the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Negotiations started in 67. It was opened for signature in 82. Uh, and it's in force since 1994. Uh, this is a very important year. You see, when the convention entered into force, that was November 94. Then, in the following year, in 95, we had the New York Agreement, on which I'll talk a later a bit about is the, the United Nations Fish Stock Agreement that happened in 95. And another very important document also was adopted in 95, which was the FAO Code of Conduct for Responsible Fishers. So these three documents, they kind of established the overall framework for international fishers. And, and the reasons they, they were developed was exactly because, remember, we had reached a plateau in the early 90s. So about mid-90s, there was a realization that fishers were in trouble and that we couldn't keep growing uh, our fishers from capture anymore. And we needed to better control the fishers' activity to ensure the sustainability of the fish stocks. So it took a while for the international community to react. And from 95, I think that's a crucial year, things started to change quite dramatically worldwide with regard to the way fishers is managed because of the legal framework changed. And we are going to see uh, over a dozen, more than 20 new instruments have been adopted by the international community. So in, in any country, I know there are many countries here, uh, you have laws and, and what people do, what the government do is regulated by 
these laws and people cannot do things that are not or are against are not in the law or against the law uh, the same happens in the international arena so now uh, until 95 the only thing we had was well before 95 we had nothing because as you saw UNCLOS entered into force in the end of 94 so by 1993 there was nothing there there was a vacuum there was no legal framework uh, establishing how fishers should be developed in the world. So uh, from 94, I mean the end of 94, in, in 95, a new set of, of legal instruments were uh, entered into, into force. Curiously, uh, in, in, in you see it, it, it has a very large number of members. We have 168 members of the, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, plus 14 that has signed it, not ratified yet, but they have signed it. It's then 182. So if you, we compare to 193 UN members, we see that pretty much everybody in the world is a member of UNCLOS. But with some few but uh, very significant exceptions, one of them is the USA. And that's a big exception because of the importance USA plays in the world and also because of the importance of the fisheries play, the US, fish, the US plays in the, in the world fisheries. But also Venezuela, Peru, and Turkey, I think these four, uh, there are other, uh, some countries that are landlocked and, and the, that uh, then wouldn't, we, we could understand that wouldn't be much interested in the, in the convention. But I think these four countries, they are very important country with regard to fishers, like Peru, for example, is one of the 10 top producers of, of fish, and, and they are not members of, uh, uh, of UNCLU. So these are the four exceptions. Uh, otherwise, everybody's there. But I have to say that even though US, for example, has not become a member uh, uh, of UNCLUS, they have applied, uh, as far as fisheries is concerned, all the rules that are, in, in, that are established by, by, by UNCLOS. So they, they obey, they apply uh, the provisions in UNCLOS even though they are not a member of UNCLOS. So it's the international constitution of the seas and includes everything from establishing boundaries like territorial sea, economic exclusive zone. You have seen that before. I mean, uh, there was, I think one of the lecture was about talking about UNCLOS, didn't it? Yeah, okay, good. So I don't have to go into much detail here. Uh, but you, you see you have a part seven, section two, that deals specifically with the conservation and management of the living resources of the high seas. And here is directly linked to the work of regional fishers management organizations. We have part 12 that deals with protection and preservation of the marine environment and several other parts that are related to, to fisheries. Uh, here's the basic uh, uh, limits, uh, maritime li limits defined uh, by UNCLOS. We have the territorial sea that goes up to 12 nautical miles and the economic exclusive zone or the exclusive economic zone that goes up to 200 nautical miles. And this is the one that interests us more uh, because the legal regime applied here, it's completely different from the legal regime applied in the high seas. Uh, where the, the mandate of several RFMOs is more di directly linked. It's important uh, to note that uh, the coastal state have the exclusive right of exploiting the fisheries resources that are inside their economic exclusive zone. But for highly migratory fish stocks that happen both inside and outside the economic exclusive zone, if the coastal state is a member of UNCLOS, as we saw pretty much everybody, then the, co the coastal state is obliged to cooperate with the decisions uh, made by regional fishers management organizations. For example, we have tuna, uh, yellowfin tuna, that happens inside Brazilian economic exclusive zone, and Brazil fish yellowfin tuna. But we cannot say, well, we are fishing this yellowfin tuna inside our EZ, so we don't give uh, we, we, are, we don't want to become a member of ICAT, so we, we won't uh, participate in, in ICAT business. We cannot do that. We are obliged to apply the management and conservation measures that are adopted by ICAT because the yellowfin tuna happens both inside Brazilian economic exclusive zone and outside in the high seas and is fished by several countries. And of course, that does make sense because uh, if it's a species that is fished by 50 countries, for example, any measure unilaterally adopted by Brazil alone 
would not suffice to ensure the sustainability of the exploitation. Any measures in this case would need to be agreed by everybody that is participating in this fishery, and that's the reason why the regional fisheries management organizations exist. Uh, there are three definitions that are important. Uh, uh, we have what we call transboundary fish stocks, and transboundary fish stocks are those stocks that happen in the same economic exclusive zone of two neighboring countries. For example, we do have Brazil and Argentina, we do have in Uruguay, we do have uh, transboundary fish stocks that are present in, in these three states. So the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea says that in this case, in case of transboundary stocks or in the case of straddling fish stocks that are stocks that happen both outside the economic exclusive zone in the high seas and inside the economic uh, exclusive zone, as well as highly migratory fish stock that also happens inside uh, the EZ, but in this case of many countries as well as in the high seas. So in all these situations, the UNCLOS oblige the countries participating in this fishery to cooperate with each other. So you can say that Brazil, Uruguay, and Argentina, we are presently in contravention of UNCLOS because we do not have a regional fisheries management organizations of these th three countries to manage the shared stocks, and we were obliged by international law to have such organization. So it, 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 it can be, be said that Brazil, Uruguay and Argentina is presently in an illegal situation uh, with regard to international law because we do not have that mechanism uh, of cooperation uh, to jointly manage the stocks that are shared, the, the case of transboundary stocks. Uh, in part five of UNCLOS, we have uh, the, the, this is the part dealing with exclusive economic zones. There are some very important paragraphs there, for example, in Paragraph 62.2, we have the coastal state shall determine its capacity to harvest the living resources of the exclusive economic zone. Because of that, many of you might not know, but uh, uh, the Brazilians here, because of that, because of that paragraph, because of these words that are here, we did have the largest uh, marine science program ever developed in Brazil, which was the Hevise program. Uh, the, the program for the assessment of national living resources. This was the, that was the largest marine science program ever developed in Brazil, and, and the reason for that, it was created because the entering into force of uh, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea in December 94, and that's exactly why the program spun from uh, 95 to 2005. Uh, yeah. So uh, we have Article 6.3 that says that stocks occurring within the economic exclusive zone of two or more coastal states or both in the EZ and in the high seas, uh, the, the countries are obliged, I cut something here, they are obliged to cooperate and that refers, sorry, this is the title of the article, that refers to transboundary or straddling stocks and here is the part, the, the paragraph two of this article that clearly says that uh, those states have to cooperate. They shall cooperate either directly or through appropriate sub-regional or regional fisheries management organizations. Uh, the same in high seas, Article 118 says that, uh, which uh, deals with the cooperation of states in the conservation and management of living resources in the high seas, also establishes their obligations uh, saying states shall cooperate with each other in the conservation and management of living resources in the areas of high seas. So the consequence of that is that all states that fish for straddling and highly migratory fish stocks, they are obliged to cooperate for the management and conservation of the shared resources. All states that are party to UNCLOS, they are obliged by international law to apply the management and conservation measures adopted by a regional fisheries management organization, even though they are not obliged to become a member of that RFMO. So there is a, a, a Pacta Tertis of Vienna Convention, which says that nobody is obliged to become a member of any treaty. So you are not, if Brazil doesn't want to be part of ICAT, it doesn't have to. It wouldn't be in a, in a legal situation not to become a member of ICAT. Nevertheless, the obligation for Brazil to apply the management and conservation measures adopted by ICAT would still apply. 
So it would be a great disadvantage to Brazil not to be a member because it, it would mean we would have just to implement the measures but not having the opportunity to discuss them. And so every, it, it's on everybody's interest to, to participate in these RFMOs because it's the opportunity they have to discuss the measures, the conservation and management measures that that given RFMO will adopt because either if they are member or if they are not, if they are part of UNCLOS, they are obliged to uh, apply the conservation and management measures adopted by that RFMO. Okay, any doubt so far? Any question? No? No burning question? Yeah, please go ahead. I talk too much. Okay. Um, what you said about the developing and uh, developed countries. Ah, good. Okay. Hi. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'll so start again. So I actually have a quick question in, in regards to what you said in the beginning between difference between uh, developing and developed countries okay. and how well they are doing. Um, so my doubt is actually, although I agree that they probably do have better management, isn't it also because the developed countries are, as in with everything, just exploiting the developing countries, directly or indirectly? Uh, well, that's a tricky question. <laughs> well, it, it well... Uh, hmm. Because it's cheaper to f now, for example, import fish from China than it is hmm. to fish it in your area. So yeah, that, that's, that's <laughs> definitely part of the problem, the international trade uh, of fish. Uh, Yes, and there is also another problem that is developed states fishing coastal resources in developing countries through uh, international agreements that uh, in many cases it might be argued that are not in the best interest of developing states, for example. Besides that, uh, with regard to, to international, uh, sh internationally shared stocks, for example, in the case of RFMOs, if you take a look at ICAT and you see who is, well, ICAT uh, manages about uh, 600,000 tons of fish a year. And if we take a look who is catching the most of it, you are going to see that the vast majority of those catches are being done by Europe, Japan, some well-developed uh, countries with well-developed fisheries. And one of the big fights we have been having uh, since the New York Agreement, and we are going to talk about that right now, is exactly uh, to, with regard to the legitimate aspirations of developing states to also participate in the high seas fisheries. Because when we started to develop our fisheries, it's kind of, well, all the stocks are already being exploited uh, at MSY, so I'm sorry, but there is no space left to you guys to come now because we are already fishing it at the level that it can be fished. Uh, and in fact, I mean, if you see most of these stocks managed by the, those RFMOs, uh, some better, some worse, but they are generally about MSY level, meaning th they can't increase. I mean, the amount of tuna we can catch from the Atlantic is not going to increase. The, the size of the pie, of the tuna pie, or the tuna pizza, if for those who prefer pizza, the size of that tuna pizza is set. It's not going to grow. So the discussion now is which size of slice goes to each country. And in that case, developing states have been lagging away behind and having not, they have had not the opportunity to develop their fishers. And partly because you see, and we are talking about that later on, is the case of the egg and the chicken. Uh, because for example, we have to share quotas of a given species, let's say yellowfin tuna. And then, uh, in the, in, the, in the negotiation of quota, we'll say, some country will say, well, you are asking for 1,000 tons, but can you fish that? It said, no, I can only fish 100 tons because I don't have boats. So why are you asking a quota of 1,000 tons if you can only catch 100 tons? But what happens then is that because you have only 100 tons, then you cannot develop your fleet. So you can have a quota because you don't have a fleet, but you can't have a fleet because you don't have a quota. And that's the situation we have been facing, and, and it's a big struggle that has been going on for, for quite a while now, as I was saying, since 95, pretty much. The situation started to change, at least in ICAT, uh, um, from 1998 on, but still, I, I see uh, as a very 
strongly imbalanced situation where most of the benefits coming from the fisheries goes to developed states and the, the opportunities while the, the developing states uh, have their opportunities to develop their fishers uh, much uh, restricted or restrained. Um, yes. Um, I had a question on something you said a little a while before. Um, so you talked about the increase of stocks in several countries, yes. uh, some species. Yes. So I was wondering um, what happens with non-commercial species, the ones we don't use to eat or in the trade. Yep. So do, do these stocks of non-commercial fishes increase decreased are we even monitoring that yeah and yeah Th this is a very good question is exactly that the ecosystem approach and 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 so taking from uh, anybody has another yeah so because i will explain you in the context of this slide uh just continuing with the idea of yeah. her question i think it would be very interesting to have statistics of the of the countries who demand consumption of exploited over exploited stocks to I don't know, compare, compare information because yeah. there, has to be, there has to be a reason why developing countries seem to not be regulating their stocks uh, appropriately. Well, well w one very simple reason is because to have a, a, a good fisheries management system in place is very expensive. That's, that's the, 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 the most obvious and immediate reason. You need to have a good system to collect data, to gather data. We need scientists to analyze this data. We, we, you need to have a, a, a regular stock assessments being done. And all that costs a lot of money. And, and the monitoring, control, and surveillance system that needs to be in place to ensure that you are getting the right data, all that's expensive. And for a well-developed country, uh, they, they have the means to do that. Uh, but in a developing state, when you have to choose, for example, uh, between uh, either control the fisheries, uh, 30 minutes, thank, either better put uh, 1 million reais in, in better controlling the fisheries or putting 1 million reais to help feed the people, it, you, you are faced with very tough choices many times. And, and that's the reason, I think that's the main reason. It, it's expensive, but that's no excuse to not have nothing in place because there are alternatives. And, and, and saying that, uh, by saying that, I'm, I'm saying that the reason why Brazil has, doesn't have presently a good a fi a man fisheries management system in place is not, is not because of a lack of money. Is because of a lack of political will. Is because it has not have it have hasn't been the priority of of the recent governments, unfortunately. Okay, so uh, continuing on, then we had in '95 uh, the New York Agreement, the so-called New York Agreement, sometimes called UNFSA, United Nations Fish Stock Agreement, and that agreement regulated. The, it, it's part of the UNCLOS, it's part of the convention, it's part of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which regulates specifically the fisheries for highly migratory fish stocks. And there are some things that this agreement introduced, you see, 95, in 95, that changed the way fishers has been managed not only by states, but mainly by regional fishers management organizations. For instance, uh, well, it, it was open for signature in 95, but it entered into force only in, in 2001. It now has eight member states, so it hasn't uh, uh, enjoyed the, the, the much uh, at, at, at level of adherence as, as the convention, but uh, anyway, it's, it's pretty significant, the number of states already part of it. Uh, but it introduced, for example, in Article 6, 5 and 6, the precautionary approach. That's the first time in the international law where the precautionary approach was spelled out uh, very clearly, saying that the lack of data should be no excuse not to apply conservation and management measures. And the, the less data you have, the more precautionary you need to be, not the contrary. So you can't use the excuse, well, since I have no data, then we can develop the fish and see what happens. That doesn't go with the precautionary approach. If you don't have data, you can't develop your fishery. So uh, the less data you have, the more precautionary you need to be. 
uh, and also the ecosystem approach, which is exactly the question you had have just made up to then, uh, up to the early 90s, the fisheries management was pretty much done on the basis of the target species only. So ICAT, for example, wouldn't care for sharks or seabirds or sea turtles. We were only worried about tunas, the target species. And even the convention of ICAT itself clearly said that the mandate of the convention was to manage tunas. So we were not even allowed to manage sharks or seabirds because it was not in the convention. We ended up doing so because the legal framework changed. But at any time, a member could say, well, I disagree with this shark measure because the convention says that we only can deal with tunas. And would have a case, would have a very strong legal case. Nobody did that because the, the measures that have been agreed have been agreed on the basis of consensus, but it could have happened, could have happened uh, because, because of the convention. So that changed. And uh, also the obligation to cooperate uh, was clearly established uh, in, in Article 9, sorry, in Article uh, 8, saying that coastal states and states fishing in the high seas, they shall cooperate uh, to generate data and also to manage the, these, the stocks they share. Uh, the obligation to submit scientific data was established in Article 14. I won't go through that, and, but the consequence was that all states that fish for straddling and highly migratory fish stocks, they are obliged to provide scientific, technical, and statistical data to RFMOs. For example, uh, I said that Brazil fishing for yellowfin tuna, we were obliged to uh, implement, to apply the management and conservation measures adopted by ICAT, but not only that, because we are also part of the New York Agreement, we are obliged to supply, to provide data on the Brazilian tuna fisheries. Uh, in part seven is a particularly important part for developing states and going to the point that you were, ra sorry, your name? Yasmina, Yasmina was raising uh, here before. Uh, in, 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 the, in the process of adopting the New York Agreement, there was a big divide because there are some provisions in New York Agreement. For example, there is one provision that allows uh, a patrol vessel from a developed state or for any state, for example, in the high seas to board and inspect the, the fishing vessel of any other state that is part of that agreement. And that was very hard for Brazil to accept. For example, uh, if, we, if we are fishing the high seas because we are part of New York Agreement, a uh, patrol vessel from, from US, to give an example, or from uh, Japan, let's say, a uh, patrol vessel from Japan can come and can board and can inspect a Brazilian fishing vessel. And there is a, an issue uh, uh, with sovereignty there that was very complicated for Brazil to accept that. Several Latin American countries have never and will never accept that and will not become a member of the New York Agreement because of that, for instance. So why Brazil did accept that? Because, of course, there is a very strong asymmetry there. So how many, how many uh, Japanese fishing vessels, for example, fish in the Atlantic Ocean, you think that Brazil, Brazilian Navy will be able to board and inspect in the high seas? And how many Brazilian fishing vessels will be bored and inspected in the high seas. So there's a strong asymmetry there. Uh, but we did agree and we became members because there is this part seven, which fully recognized the requirements of developing states. And some parts here are extremely, extremely important to us. And it was mainly because of the New York agreement that we were able to change the way the quotas were distributed among countries, for example, in the context of ICAT. Because here we have, for example, uh, that states shall cooperate to enhance the ability of developing states, not only to conserve and manage the stocks they fish for, the straddling hagley migratory fish stocks, but also to develop their own fishers for such stocks. And this is extremely important. So uh, they are all members obliged to assist developing states to enable them to participate in the high seas fishers for such stocks, including facilitating access to such fishers. So uh, the New York Agreement gave full recognition of the right of developing states to participate in the high seas fishers, in the fisheries for highly migratory fish stocks. Not only that, it also obliged members to assist developing states in that endeavor. 
So uh, other international instruments that have been adopted by the United Nations, uh, particularly by the FAO Committee on Fisheries, are the Code of Conduct for Responsible Fishers, also in 95. So everything that you can think of fishers is included in the code, from capture to processing to trade. Everything is there. So it has become a, a Bible of, of how to sustainably uh, conduct responsible fishers. Differently from UNCLOS and from the New York Agreement, the Code of Conduct is not binding. It has a voluntary nature. So it has a different nature. Nevertheless, I can, we can state without uh, fearing uh, of being wrong that the code has become so much embraced by the international community that it has gained a binding uh, nature. Nobody, you, can't, you cannot think of anybody in any international meeting now uh, taking the floor to speak against what is in the Code of Conduct. So what is there has become enshrined, enshrined, enshrined uh, as, as, as uh, uh, international law in a way, although it's soft law, it's, it's not binding, but it has uh, gained a binding nature. Uh, from the Code, we had the International Plans of Action for the Conservation and Management of Sharks, uh, for reducing the catch of seabirds, for the management of fishing capacity, and to prevent, deter, and eliminate IU fishing, the illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. We also had, uh, following that, the FAO strategy for improving information on the status and trends of captured fisheries, the FAO agreement to promote compliance with international conservation and management measures by fishing vessels uh, on the high seas, the international guidelines for the management of deep sea fishers in the high seas, the international guidelines on bycatch management and reduction of discards, the guidelines for the eco-labeling of fish and fishery products from marine capture fisheries, the agreement on port state measures, the voluntary guidelines for flag state performance, and finally the voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small scale fishers in the context of food security and poverty eradication on which Anthony has talked uh, previously. So, Summing up, we have a very broad legal framework today that established the rules uh, based on which the international fisheries can be and should be developed. So uh, like we have a constitutions in our countries and the law, we also have the international constitution on the law of the sea, which is the convention and the laws that regulate how fisheries and aquaculture should be developed in the world. And this international legal framework is given effect by the international governance system that includes, and here I have to open a, parent, a parenthesis, Anthony talked about governance quite a lot, uh, and I was telling him during lunch that the word governance has faced a very strong opposition in international fora, and it has become a forbidden word because it has not been properly defined. For example, uh, now, uh, uh, three weeks ago, about a month ago, in the last meeting of the FAO Committee on Fisheries, uh, the final report was to be adopted, and the word governance was there, and several delegations took the floor to say, we cannot agree with the word governance. So every reference to governance here will need to be deleted. And there was a proposition to substitute governance by management. So wherever we, we had fisheries governance, then became fisheries management. And there is, there is someone from Argentina here? Yeah, Argentina has been particularly strong against the use of the word governance for several reasons that would take a bit too long for us to discuss here. But uh, that's to show that this process of negotiating in, in international forums is, is very complex and in many cases it comes down to, to how you use one word or another. For example, you can't use the word governance and I think uh, uh, a, a document or an international instrument would have to be adopted defining that before we could use that uh, in this international negotiation process. Just a curiosity but it's important to understand how this game is played. So everything, I mean, the, the, in, in terms of international governance, the, the highest forum is 
of course, the United Nations and the United Nations General Assembly that every year adopt a resolution on sustainable fishery. So if Brazil has uh, an emerging problem, Brazil come to the realization that, uh, let's say, the, the, the pollution by plastic in the marine environment is something very important that needs to be addressed. Let's say that has that had not happened already, has, it has. So uh, when possible, and, and one of the most obvious ways to do that would to bring that up to be included in the next resolution on sustainable fishes by the United Nations. So it's where things pretty much start uh, with regard to the international governance. Then under the United Nations, just below that, we then have the Committee on Fisheries. The FAO Committee on Fisheries was created in 1965, and it has been since then the only global intergovernmental forum where major international fishers and aquaculture problems and issues are examined and recommendations addressed to governments, regional fisheries bodies, NGOs, fish workers, FAO and international community periodically on a worldwide basis. We saw all those international instruments that I have just shown to you, over 20 instruments, all of them, they were uh, prepared discussed and adopted by FAO Committee on Fisheries. So much of what we have, uh, besides the 15 minutes I have left, much of all we have today with regard to the international legal framework has been a result of the work by the FAO Committee on Fisheries. So in, under the Committee on Fisheries, what happens and it's decided in the Committee of Fisheries is then taken to the regional fishers management organizations or arrangements. Uh, we many, many times see that, that kind of acronym, RFMOAs. What's the difference between arrangement and organization? Not really. Arrangement is more because sometimes you have an arrangement that is not an actual organization. It doesn't have a headquarters, for example. It's more a kind of an agreement that is implemented and applied, but without a formal uh, uh, headquarter or a more formal organization, so it's called an arrangement. So we have both uh, regional fishers management organizations and arrangements. We have more than 50 now in the whole, in the whole world. Uh, five of them are exclusively dedicated to tuna species. That is ICAT, the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, the IATTC, the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission, the WCPFC, the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, IOTC, the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission, and CCSPT, which is the Commission for the Conservation of Salt and Bluefin Tuna. Uh, Brazil is member presently of ICAT and of CAMELA. CAMELA is the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. We are not member of CCSPT, although we should, because we do catch some amount of salt and bluefin tuna, although in small quantities, but we should be participating uh, in that organization as well. One thing that's very important to, to tell you at this moment is that everything is interconnected. So. You see here that what is discussed in UN and is then taken by the Committee on Fisheries that is then taken by regional fisheries management organizations. This is a more vertical structure of integration, but everything is also interconnected horizontally. So what is discussed in the World Trade Organization, for example, in many instances, have a direct consequence for fisheries. And or in CITES, a decision made in CITES will affect what is being discussed uh, in ICAT, for example. So there are many, many fora now that discusses issues related to fisheries. And here, it's very important to draw the attention for one of the main weaknesses of developing states. For example, if you go to a meeting of WTO that is going to discuss fisheries subsidies, it's an issue that is being presently discussed in WTO, in the World Trade Organization, you will find a Japanese delegate there that is going to be the same guy that's going to be in New York in the following month, participating in the meeting of uh, United Nations Fish Stock Agreement uh, parties, and that will be the same guy that you are going to find in CITES, in the Convention uh, of International Trade of Endangered Species. So, meaning that they have a, an a, extremely 
uh, effective coordination of what is being discussed in all these different fora, because a decision you made in WTO might have a direct consequence on what you are discussing in ICAT. And in the case of Brazil, for example, you have one people in a different, a different people, a different person in a different place. So if you go to a meeting of the Convention on, on Biological Diversity, you have a, a diplomat there that has no idea many times, most of the times, what is ICAT. And you have a different one in ICAT, and you have a different one in, in WTO, and they don't talk to each other. They don't coordinate as they should. And that means that we lose many battles because we are not aware of what is going on in, a, in, a, in, a, in this interconnected uh, world. In, in the case of Brazil, that's probably also a consequence of, of, of the historical way the Minister of Foreign Affairs has been structured. Like in the, in the in the past century, it it, it would would work well because things were not as connected and wouldn't happen with the v velocity that uh, is happening today. But in the present world, if we don't have a very strong and efficient and rapid uh, coordination among these different institutions of a given state to address these specific issues like fisheries, you are sooner or later going to lose. Uh, because you might even win something in ICAT, for example, and you celebrate that, but in the next week, something different is going to be agreed in WTO that would revert or would nullify the, 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 the success you could have had because of the decision uh, that was made in, in, in ICAT, for example. So consistency and coordination uh, is a big difference between developed and developing states in the way they participate in this international forum to our disadvantage very much so. So today in the world we have more than 50 RFMOs, pretty much the whole world is covered, but we do have some important gaps, for example, we have a very important gap here. So Brazil, Uruguay and Argentina, we do not have a fishers management organization and we should uh, that borders our EZ recently. The Southeast Atlantic Fishers Organization even consulted, uh, was studying the possibility of extending its mandate to cover the whole South Atlantic. And of course, that would be very bad for Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay, because then we would be pretty much obliged to become a member of an, an, an organization that, that already existed. And, and it's always a bad thing to, to get on the train when it has been moving for quite a few years now, which is the case of CIAFO. Uh, and But of course, we are the only ones to be blamed for it. Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay should have for quite a long time now get together and uh, lead it. Uh, the way for the creation of a regional fisheries management organization in the Southwest Atlantic, which is pretty much uh, our quintal, as you say in Portuguese. I don't know what's the name in, in English. Backyard. backyard, yes, exactly that. Thank you so much, in our backyard. And here are the, the tuna regional fisher management organizations. We have ICAT, uh, which is the most important to Brazil, of course, because uh, we fish for tunas and it's in the Atlantic. Uh, but we have the IATTC, the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission here, that is uh, with the West Eastern Pacific, then WCPFC, the Western Pacific, and the I IOTC in the Indian Ocean, and CCSBT that uh, deals with uh, the bluefin tuna that is distributed to the south. And we also have the GFCM, is a, a General Fisheries Commission for the Mediterranean that also, also has uh, an interface uh, with some tuna species. So most tuna and tuna-like species, like swordfish, bluefish, sharks, they are cosmopolitan and highly migratory. And of course, because of that, they can only be managed by RFMOs, as I explained it before. It would be totally useless for Brazil to uh, adopt any management or conservation measures in relation to yellowfin tuna uh, if that had not been coordinated with all other states that fish for the same species. These are the main tuna species uh, that these RFMOs manage, the yellowfin tuna, the big eye tuna, we call them tropical tuna together with skipjack tuna, these three are the tropical tunas, the big eye, the yellowfin, the skipjack, uh, the bluefin tuna, we have the southern bluefin tuna uh, and the Atlantic bluefin tuna, the albacore tuna and the swordfish. These six species are the main species, uh, the most valuable that are managed by regional fisheries management organizations. A significant amount of bycatch uh, is the bluefishes and several 
shark species. So complementing uh, the answer to the question related to the ecosystem approach until 95, uh, until the enter, uh, until, until not the entry into force, but until uh, the United Nations Fish Stock Agreement was drafted, uh, the management of the fishers was done pretty much by the target species, but after that, uh, there was a, a growing concern and, and even a legal obligation to apply the ecosystem approach. And that has been in, in the international agenda since then uh, quite significantly. And, and there are a lot of debate on exactly what that means. So uh, you, we see expressions like uh, ecosystem approach to fishers management and ecosystem based fishers management. Uh, although every RFMO is obliged to apply somehow the ecosystem approach, the way they have been doing that has varied quite significantly. And I don't, I don't know anybody or any state or any international organization that has so far been able to apply fully what we would call the ecosystem-based fishers management. That would mean that ICAT would not manage yellowfin tuna stock or big eye tuna stock independently. It would manage all the fish species that would be caught by the fisheries, not only the target species, but also bluefishes and sharks, not only that, but also seabirds and turtles, the ecosystem as a whole. That has not been possible, and it's very unlikely that it's going to be possible in the near future, because it's extremely complex. The, the main problem we have with fisheries management today is the lack of data. That's the main difficulty. Uh, we have very sophisticated uh, population dynamics models that can be applied, but they need the better the data you have, the more accurate uh, the, these models will provide you with an assessment of, of, of the stock. Like we saw the problem in, in Canada, uh, that the, the models used then they were not accurate enough to provide uh, uh, an accurate view of what was really going on with the stock. And part of the problem was because the other species interacting with the cod were not considered in that model. And that is still is the case for most of the fishers and for most organizations and states in the world. Uh, in, even in ICAT, for example, uh, we, don't, we do not have a single example of any, today, any uh, population any stock assessment model that have incorporated jointly different species. And scientifically, we still are quite far away from that. We have very sophisticated models to do stock assessments, but most of them, if not all of them, are pretty much single species uh, assessment models. There are alternative models that can be used, uh, but they haven't been uh, use it in fishers management because of the complexity and difficulty to apply these ecosystem ecosystem models. So we have to recognize that limitation. So uh, if you ask me, but uh, is ICAT applying the ecosystem approach? I will say yes. But how? Well, what ICAT has been doing, and we are going to see that uh, soon, and, and the same has happened in several other RFMOs, that they are starting to adopt conservation and management measures to protect those species that are not target of the fisheries, like bluefishes, like sharks, like seabirds, like sea turtle. But that does not mean that ICAT is doing an ecosystem-based fisheries management. It's, it's much different from that. Okay, so we also have the oceanic sharks that are caught as bycatch. Yeah, I got just to the half and half of the time, which is great. So, uh, how the RFMOs work, and we will take a look at ICAT example after the break, but now I think I still have time for a question or two, if, is there any? Please. No? Doesn't. Yeah, here. Hi, I'm Rafael from Brazil. I have one simple question about the ghost nets. We, we heard a lot about them by they are there in the ocean catching a lot of uh, biota. And if it's considered in the UN resolution of sustainable fisheries, or is related or something. And about Brazil, more specific maybe, 
We have the lack of data, we know, but we also have the lack of fiscalization on the field. We know some places we have the, the law, but you don't, you don't have people to, for fiscalization. And you have any perspectives about the, this lack of data and fiscalization? Yeah, yes, well, on the first question, the UN has taken the problem of ghost fishing quite seriously. And if you take a look at the UN resolution of sustainable fishery, it has been for quite a few years now, over a decade, an entire paragraph dedicated to the need to, to prevent and to take action against that. One of the first measures that was adopted by the UN was exactly the banning of uh, large drift nets in the ocean. And that was taken by the UN. It was one of the first, if not the, if not the first uh, uh, a resolution specifically dealing with fishers that was adopted by the United Nations. So that gives you an idea on how serious the issue is and that also that the UN is taking very serious action on that. Uh, with regard to the second question, you are absolutely right. We do not only have a problem of lacking of data, which is absolutely crucial because without it we can't uh, do any planning. But we also have a lack of enforcement and that needs to be much improved. But the, what we really need, and, and that's a, a, something I, I have realized quite a few years ago in, in my 30 years uh, uh, dealing with fisheries management, is that much more important than enforcement is to ensure that all fishing communities and fishers have the opportunity to participate in decision-making process. And that's what we are lacking in Brazil. During the time in 2015 when we, I was participating in the Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture, our top priority was uh, the establishment of the Standing Committee for the Management of Different Fisheries, which was a council that it's now starting to, to get implemented a few years after 2015, uh, where uh, the fisheries sector, the uh, NGOs, and everybody that had, every stakeholder that has a say uh, with regard to a given fisher would have the opportunity to participate in the decision making process. If there is one thing that we should have learned by now, is that there is no fisheries management without full participation of stakeholders. Fisheries management is, has become, in my view, a synonym of uh, participatory fisheries management because there is no other fish, fish possibility of success of a fisheries management that is not participatory. And uh, meaning that if the fishing communities are not directly engaged and involved and are uh, uh, in agreement with uh, and participate in the decision making, uh, there is no way we can we can ensure enforcement. Of course, we have to improve enforcement, but the key is not improve enforcement. The key is improving participation of fishers, uh, of stakeholders in the decision making process. In my view. Uh, good morning, everybody's listening. Good morning. Uh, Nice to meet you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. My name is Bruno from Brazil. Uh, on that, the, the first group of slides you use about the global fishing, uh, I would like for you to comment, please, about the effort necessary to catch those fishes, because they're not on the slide. They're only the yield, but not the effort from the vessels. Yeah, uh, well, that would be a bit more complicated, because uh, there are some information on the effort. For example, you can get uh, global information, the number of vessels in operation and things like that. And I could have uh, brought uh, some of those slides here. But I don't know any, any global uh, figure that conveys what would be really important in the context of what you are asking. That would be the catch per unit of effort in all these fishes. That would be the best, but I don't, I don't think we have that in a global scale. We have that for specific fish stocks, for example. We can, and I'm going to show that for big eye tuna, for example, for bluefin tuna. I'm going to show uh, the, how the, this, the catch parent of effort trend happened, uh, the effort and, and the yield, how they have behaved in the context of these specific stocks. And you can find thousands of those kind of examples. 
but I don't know any publication that pull all that together, you know, and as we have for the global yield of, of, of fish production. It's, of course, much easier to have global yield of fish production than to have effort. For example, in case of Brazil, it would be uh, much, much, it, it is much easier to have an idea on how much tuna we are catching, but it's much, much more difficult to know how many boats are fishing the tuna we are catching, for example. So it's a much more complicated and difficult information to raise to get, particularly in a global level. You tell me huh, when the time is over, okay? Hi, I'm Jerry from the Philippines. I would just like to ask if there are um, implications to the non-compliance of China to the 2016 South China Sea ruling. And does it affect the credibility of UNCLOS in general? since its militarization and reclamation activities are still ongoing? Yes, I think that's a very, very legal question, and I think a lawyer should address that. Uh, I'm more on, on the fisheries, but uh, what I can tell you uh, from what I know is that uh, there is a, a particular clause, I don't remember uh, an article in, in UNCLOS that deals specifically with the island regime and what has happened throughout the world, not only in China, but uh, in many places, is that uh, very small rocks in the ocean, uh, they are being turned into uh, inhabited area, uh, even using concrete and a lot of construction to build things there, because that particular provision, I don't remember exactly the number, 100, 30 something, I think. Anyway, says that uh, rocks in the ocean only have 200 economic exclusive zone around it, uh, if it's occupied, if, if, it, if it can sustain human habitation and has an economic life, for example. And so Japan, China, many countries are taking small rocks that where they consider to be theirs, and they have built big structures around those rocks to make sure that they are seen as uh, part of their territory and part of their 200 economic, and, and that, and 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 then they are uh, invoking the right to have 200 economic exclusive zone around uh, those islands. That has not been recognized by several nations that don't agree with the way these things being done, and there is a lot of tension going on in the in the China Sea, for example. And uh, but I really uh, don't know much about it, not much beyond what I have just told you, because this is a very specific legal question, not related to, to fisheries directly. But uh, with regard to Brazil, in this sense, we do have a situation that it's not like that, but uh, it's very important to us. Uh, we have a scientific station, for example, in the archipelago of St. Peter and St. Paul, and we did build uh, that station there to prove that we could sustain life and the fisheries around the, that area is also a way to show that there is economic uh, income coming from the activities that are being done in, in, in that area. So uh, it, this was also linked to the pledge of Brazil. Uh, in, in fact, we, we, we requested not, we placed it, well, we consider that we do have a, a 200 economic exclusive zone around St. Peter and St. Paul, and then that, that has been unilaterally put to the international community by Brazil because it's our interpretation of the convention, and it hasn't been questioned so far. But the, 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 the research station we built there was partly driven by the need to have a full occupation in the island because of that particular provision on which number I forget. And it's, it's very funny when you take a look of some of these small rocks, you, you, I can bring you some photos, really, really funny photos. You have a, a, a rock that is maybe 10 meters and you have a, 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 a small cabin there and, and two guys there, you know, with an arm saying that, wow, we are living here, so we, we have the right to 200 economic exclusive zone around a small, tiny bit of rock. Yes, go ahead, please. Yes, hi. Um, I worked um, as a fisheries observer in the tuna fisheries at the Pacific Islands Regional Office 
for a couple of years, and well, I realized that um, it's an extremely hard work, like uh, you work under extremely harsh conditions, yeah. and like you can see that the United Sta States has a uh, great data manage management for the fisheries because it's a well, uh, well-paid job, but I highly doubt that any other country could collect the kind of data that they do. Yeah. Um, they cover 20% of the tuna fisheries and 100% uh, of the swordfish fisheries. So my question would be, like, how would you envision um, uh, collecting data of fisheries worldwide um, if, uh, like, uh, globally, if, uh, like, I, I could only see, like, a country like the U.S. doing it, like, um, I, I don't see like any other country would be able to do it. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right about, about that. There is a big difficulty there because it's very expensive. One way to address that would to do that collectively, for example, uh, to ICAT to have, as, as it has been done, for example, uh, Brazil, as a member of ICAT, we have been paying quite a significant amount of money every year to keep an observer program running in the bluefin tuna fishery. We don't fish for bluefin tuna, but we have been paying for that. And that's the only way I see it. Uh, it has to be done by the RFMOs themselves collectively. So those who can afford more can pay more. And the way the, the payment uh, uh, of contributions to RFMOs is structured already takes that into account. Uh, and of course, there is always some possibility of limited effort being done uh, by, by different countries. Like in Brazil, uh, we had for quite a few years uh, an observer program and that was paid by the owner of the vessel. So that's another alternative I, and I don't see any reason for something like that not to happen. So if you want to fish for tunas, you are going to make profit from that fishery, you have to pay to keep an observer on board. Of course, you, we, we shouldn't do the way we use it to do in Brazil because then the fishing company was paying the observer directly and that's the worst way possible to do it, of course, for obvious reasons. But then the fishing company might pay a, 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 a fee or in the fishing license they, they have to, to renew every year and, and then you'd have some money included uh, for satellite tracking for VMS system, for example, and also some money to have some observer coverage that don't need to be 100%. Uh, you can run some statistical tests and see that if you have sometimes 10% uh, or even less than that, 5% observer coverage would already give you, depending on the feature, of course, on the variance of the feature, would give you already uh, uh, an enough good uh, assessment uh, on bycatch species and on, on a lot of information that you can only get if you have an observer on board. And so it's feasible, it's doable. And again, it's much more about having the political will to implement that than about money because there are alternatives that could uh, superate the problem of money shortage. Can we go to the break and then we resume the class after okay. the break with Professor so. Fabio. Thank you. Thank you.